Welcome to uh, Whitechapel Online. My name is uh, Gareth Evans. I'm the adjunct moving image curator here at Whitechapel Gallery. I'm, of course, not necessarily at Whitechapel Gallery. I'm in a different time and place, which is exactly what uh, one of the key uh, considerations of our evening is here. I'm the adjunct moving image film curator at uh, Whitechapel Gallery. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to the first of uh, the online series um, uh, under my supervision um, at Whitechapel Gallery. As you'll know, we have been through difficult times over the last months. We continue to go through uh, such times and we need all the advice, the insights of history and the understanding of culture that we can bring to this time to uh, help us through difficult periods into hopefully some form of clearer uh, and brighter and more optimistic future. Now, whether any of those things will transpire is of course not the fault of the culture that we might be using uh, to investigate the times, but it's the hope of that culture. Well, certainly the hope of me as the moderator of this uh, event tonight with our wonderful guest, very soon to be introduced. Now, this event has come about because of the noted conjunction between two very sad passings, but passings of such giant figures that in a way, of course, very actively and in a real sense, they do still live with us. They are, of course, Humphrey Jennings and Walter Benjamin. Humphrey Jennings died 70 years ago today in an accident in Greece. More on that, I'm sure, shortly. And on Saturday, the 26th of September, Walter Benjamin took his own life faced with the fascist threat of the Second World War uh, in Spain in 1940, 80 years ago on Saturday. Deaths separated by 10 years, cultural figures of great significance in their own realms and internationally, continuing to influence culture today. Did they meet in person? That's a very large and significant question. Did they meet intellectually, philosophically and culturally? That's what we're going to find out now uh, with our wonderful guest, who I'm delighted to introduce now, filmmaker Adam Kossoff and philosopher, thinker and cultural theorist Esther Leslie. Please welcome them now. There they are, Esther and Adam. Thank you so much for being with us in this new online environment, which we're all, I think, with perhaps the exception of uh, the two of you, certainly I am, uh, rather uncomfortable with him uh, because Adam is a moving image maker working uh, across media. I'm sure the technology of the present and the future is, of course, uh, second nature to you. And Esther, as one of the great intellectuals thinking around uh, the present moment, I'm sure equally that you can find significant purpose within this medium. It's a great pleasure to welcome you both to think out loud about Humphrey Jennings, Walter Benjamin and Adam, your wonderful film, of course, in collaboration with Esther, through the bloody mists of time, thinking about this imagined meeting, uh, a meeting in, of intellects, cultures and minds uh, between Benjamin and Jennings. Now we've got some clips coming up over the course of the uh, evening, which is great to remind ourselves of the film, of course, but we're not showing in its entirety tonight. The film is available to view until Saturday, until uh, the anniversary of Walter Benjamin's death, uh, 26th of September, and of course has been available to view since the 17th. Many thanks indeed, Adam, for letting us uh, put the film online on the Whitechapel Gallery websites. It's great to have that chance to show the film alongside these significant dates. Now, Adam, this is a significant body of work for you. Uh, it's built it's built on on Benjamin in lots of ways. Your earlier films have, have, have referenced and engaged with him directly. But this is a very particular take on both his body of work, of course, and this, this moment, this time, this date of meeting, this imagined encounter, 1937, around the Paris Exposition, which we'll come on to shortly. But how did this idea come to you? I mean, it, once now it's given to us, it feels kind of inevitable. But of course, you know, as we know, it's far from that in the culture that we find ourselves in, in this country at least. So how did that meeting of minds uh, work its way into the origin of this film? All right. Well, thanks for having me and, and thanks for screening my film by the Whitechapel. Um, the, um, well, it's, I was looking at some of the original documents and, I think it started in 2017, so it's a hazy. Lots of things have happened since then. Um, I think it was time of Brexit, actually, and Brexit was throwing us into crisis. Well, the first crisis that we had, and is still having it, um, although it underlies the pandemic situation. So. But um, it just seemed like a relevant thing. I mean, I, I teach documentary film at Wolverhampton University and documentary has been uh, a long-term interest of mine. Jennings is obviously one of the, the main, 
you know, the main filmmakers, the main characters that you teach in terms of English, the, the documentary tradition, in terms of English documentary tradition. And uh, I've been uh, kind of obsessed with Benjamin, the same as lots of other people. And I made a, a trilogy of films around Benjamin previously. So I guess it's just a coming together. It's a kind of a montage looking at the kind of overlaps. I mean, I did actually draw up a list of things the way you could kind of, there's kind of a lot of ways in which Benjamin, Benjamin's work and, and um, Jennings's work overlaps, but of course there are differences and those differences are kind of cultural and to do with the differences between Europe and, and Britain. Thank you. I mean, Esther, this is a perfect way in, in, into your contribution, I think, because, of course, you based here in the UK, but with this deeply uh, uh, felt and, and written understanding of European culture, the 20th century, particularly your incredible and ongoing work around Benjamin. It seems a perfect way to think about that relationship between Europe and the UK, those different intellectual traditions. You've obviously been energised by Benjamin and I'm sure Jennings as well uh, in this in this dialogue. But for you, this this meeting of kind of the English tradition, shall we say, with with European intellectual culture, um, is obviously an energising one. How do you see that kind of tension playing itself out in in Adam's film, which of course you are the wonderful voice for? Um, it's interesting though. I I think what that that both Benjamin and Jennings find a home in Paris. So, you know, Benjamin leaves behind, you know, what, what for him was a stuffy Wilhelmine context that he writes about in his childhood. And then, you know, there's this brief window of experimentation in Weimar which slams shut again with with fascism. So it's an ambiguous sort of European tradition in a way. And then Jennings leaves Written behind, they, they both kind of find themselves in certain ways through Parisian surrealism. So, um, but yeah, I think uh, the way I I love the way it plays out in Adam's film to a certain extent. You know, there's a kind of it, it, they do become the puppets in a way to, to argue through the the. The, the rural, um, uh, organic, uh, rather paternalistic and social democratic, non-revolutionary traditions of, of England and versus the, the sort of uh, revolutionary, extremist, radical, um, push it through to the end kind of traditions of, of European history. So I think there's an interesting play in terms of what they both represent there and mock each other kind of through. So I think that's one way in which it uh, plays out. But also, you know, at the same time, the sense of this of, of what Paris becomes in this period, and after all it's Paris we're looking at in this narrowly slowed down town footage of, of the exhibition, that becomes a microcosm of, of everywhere in the world ex, uh, exhibition in nineteen thirty seven and with Nazism smashed up against the, the Soviet Union and then Spain and all the other countries organized around it. So I actually think the film it, itself plays out both through them and, and through what it shows at moments of extraordinary crisis and indeterminacy and sort of maybe shakes up a more uh, settled sense that you might get from something like Patrick Keeler's sort of sense. Playing with those sorts of ideas, whereas here everything is, is much more dialectical and speaking one with the other in this in this Caribbean space, which is also reflecting all the tensions and the possibilities of the world at that moment. Tremendous, thank you. Well, let's let's think, let's kind of hold those thoughts in mind and we have a look at the first clip. Before we do that, I would just like to um, thank um, Andy, Sam, Jane, and Megan all behind the scenes making this interface possible. I do hope it's reaching you in the in the best quality it can do. Uh, we're going now to have a look at them at the first clip, an introduction, if you like, 
um, uh, to uh, to this encounter, uh, taken of course from the film itself, through the bloody mist of time. Many thanks, Andy, for the first clip. So tell me, what do we have in common? Jennings then asked. Meeting here like this on an international stage, I mean a perch in the sky, is it montage or coincidence? Who knows, Benjamin replied. We lived at the same time, in a world that was about to fall apart. As did my old friend Bertolt Brecht, who wrote, You who shall emerge from the flood in which we are sinking, think when you speak of our weaknesses, also of the dark time that brought them forth. While Jennings replied, in a more modest manner, And we were both in Paris in 1937, you wrote The Arcades Project, and I wrote Pandemonium. Well, not right. Compose out of numerous historical quotations and excerpts. We both believe in the value of montage. In some ways, Pandemonium, my book, was a moving film script, a montage of images, citation without quotation marks, as you say in the Paris Arcades Project. Thank you very much indeed. Andy, that was the first clip from Through the Body Mr. Time. Just to remind uh, everyone that we are watching uh, a conversation here between um, myself, Gareth Evans, the movie image curator at Whitechapel Gallery, and our wonderful guest, the filmmaker Adam Kosov, and the thinker and cultural theorist Esther Leslie. Now, we're talking about the film. We're not watching the film in its entirety. That's available to do until the 26th of September, this Saturday. Now, Adam, having seen that introduction kind of in, in motion in, in the film, we are reminded, of course, of what said, that this is played out alongside uh, footage from the Paris Exposition in 1937, this incredibly politicised World Fair, if you like, um, just before uh, the Second World War started, where all uh, pavilions, if you like, had a heightened sense of their place in the international order. But also, crucially, it's centred around these two books, uh, the uh, RK's project, of course, Paul Benjamin and uh, Humphrey Jennings' anthology of the Industrial Age Pandemonium, both of which remain unfinished in their kind of desired sense. And that idea of the finished and the unfinished, we find sort of mirrored, if you like, in their own lives, because, of course, they both die very young, both in their 40s, um, and both uh, with huge amounts kind of, you know, waiting uh, in the wings to appear, I guess, creatively, intellectually and artistically. So when you're when you're uh, when you're assembling and compiling a found footage work in the way that you do, and which is your central metier, shall we say, how do you think about this relationship between the finished and the unfinished? Because of course you're sourcing fragments of image from across time and place. You're making a new work that is ostensibly finished, but remains kind of uh, as latent with the possibility of, of endless iterations as as their own uh, famous book works do. Well, it's, yes, I mean, what you saw in the clip was those two monoliths, actually, the two, the, the Nazi monolith and the, the communist monolith, that they both competed against each other to build bigger and bigger monoliths in this, this expo. But so, you know, my feeling is there's kind of this kind of ideological moment that really um, I needed to explore in terms of, the conflicts that were going on. It was, it was almost, the film was almost like a precursor to what was about to happen in terms of this, the Second World War and the, the traumas of, of all that. And that just kind of lies underneath the surface. And of course, it lies underneath the surface of um, everything we, you know, read and discover. Because it was, it wasn't long after that it was in exile and you know he was experiencing uh, the, the traumas of exile which um kind of uh, you know it's a kind of reminder of what people are going through today in terms of you know the the, the micro situation and troubleness of that but um so you know i'm i'm working with um 
working with a technology which is like a you know, a digital archive. Um, it's it's a weird combination. It's like 9.5 millimeter footage. I don't know if people are familiar with what 9.5 millimeter footage is, but you know, it's, I bought it off eBay, which is sometimes where you know it's a good player archive. Get it, have it transferred to, have it transferred digitally, um, telecinetic digitally, and then you kind of you're making a film um, because it's digital. It feels like it's finished, actually. Um, so, in a sense, we're talking about. It always feels like I've got something, something else. And it's very difficult to draw the line between what is complete and what is incomplete. Um, mm -hmm. I think I've kind of drawn might... the line. I think, but thank you, Adam. I think we have we're having a few uh, challenges here on the technical front. I think I'm I'm not sure how the audience are experiencing these. Unlike, of course, the nine point five millimeter footage, which has survived decades. Um, and uh, is absolutely uh, wonderful to watch, where any flaws within it, of course, become a heightened experience of the pleasure of the footage. That is not the case with these uh, digital interfaces. Uh, and yet your words, of course, still reach us, and we're very grateful indeed for them. Now, Esther, taking forward that idea of, of the finished and the unfinished, I was asking Adam about this kind of the promise of both, both writers' work, of course. They both died in their 40s with many years of, of uh, you know, uh, potential ahead of them. Now, particularly thinking with you about Benjamin, he was a, a crucial point in his life. Little did he know, of course, what was coming. But in 1937, he had obviously faced the challenges of the growing Nazi regime in Germany, uh, and he was aware that there were not easy years ahead, whatever the outcome might be. But what do you think his sense of, of the larger project of his life's work was at that point? Because you know, the Arcade's project comes to us after the event as a, an unfinished work in progress. But it wasn't the only thing, of course, that he was working on by any means. Where do you think he felt he was up to it in 1937? Um, well, Esther might be a better person to answer. Yeah, this, the, the, this, this would be for Esther, actually, Adam, if we could. Yeah, just in, in the sense of that, if Esther can hear us. Yeah. Esther, could you... Yeah, yeah I think some of his most celebrated works were, were written in precisely this period, I think. I mean, particularly the the work of art in the age of its technical reproducibility, which he's probably most well known for, is written you know, from 1935 through these years. The um, his work on Edward Hook, the collector, and so on, written in 37, the storyteller in 36. So, in some ways, in terms of writing these essays, these perfect forms, um, which have this in. in uh, aesthetic analysis of mass culture, technology, um, um, the, the impulses towards collecting and so on. This, this is really his, his high point, and that all goes along with the work uh, on the arcade, which reaches a new phase um, in this period, where he sort of has this much more explicitly marked this materialist turn, so conceptually, I think he probably felt he was, you know, at the top of his game. But um, uh, in terms of his live, living, you know, he's living from hand to mouth. He's moving around Paris, renting from, begging for money from the Dorno and Horkheimer. So I also think it's personally a, a very, very difficult period for high, but time for him and politically just, just after it. Spanish Civil War has started. Uh, things are just getting worse and worse and worse in Germany. So many of his books are left behind. He can never get back to them. And so I think it's it's difficult, but that's the kind of crisis that also squeezes thoughts from you sort of rapidly and um, intensely, I guess. Mm. Thank you very much indeed. It would be nice now if we could think, I think, just Adam, a little bit just before we go back to to the film for the second clip about where Jennings feels he is at this point because of course we're we're more familiar with Jennings as as a, a, a documentary filmmaker here in the UK but also crucially he was um, someone who uh, was crucial in the setting up of mass observation 
uh, in the in the UK. This idea of a kind of uh, a, to a totalizing survey, if you like, of, of British behaviour and and uh, patterns of living and so on. So this was something that would would have already been underway at this point. But how do you think? How do you think Jennings was thinking about his life work? At, uh, you know, in this in this shall we say this year of thirty seven. You think he felt that he was in, in the midst of his project, or was it still awaiting him? Well, I mean, people say different things about Jennings. They say that he wasn't a filmmaker, voice, that he started making working for the GPO film unit because he needed the money. But you know, uh, people like Coldstream were doing it, doing the same similar kind of thing. So. Um, people were, you know, he came from the arts. He came, he worked, he worked in theatre in Cambridge, and he he was a surrealist painter, and he wrote poetry. So, you know, he had a he had a broad range of interests in the arts. And, but oddly enough, he got involved with mass observation. He replied uh, to an advert in the New Statesman. He got involved in mass observation, observing people in Bolton and. Uh, just, I think that was kind of made him as a filmmaker. I think that mm -hmm. without mass observation, he would not have made the films that he made. He would have not have had that kind of distinctive poetic voice, which put him in touch with people up in the north, as it were. You know, like mm -hmm. the, the great subject of today, actually, like London, London people being out of touch with people in the north and vice versa. So. So, I mean, he was the great connector in a way, and he did it in a way which was celebratory rather than patronising, you know. So mass observation, you know, it enabled him to make films like Listen to Britain and really kind of put him on the level, on the ground level, which, you know, Benjamin was always also always trying to be on a ground level, but he was obviously coming from a more kind of academic, theoretical mm -hmm. point of view. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That, that's a great way in, I think, to the next clip, if we could, please, Andy, then. Thank you very much. Jennings isn't your typical Cambridge Brit, at least not the archetypal git. Possibly. I don't remember. I was an avid reader of all the French surrealist journals. Benjamin reflects. For him, the sea that divides Europe from Britain is wider than the Pacific Ocean. He says, I don't think the British ever really got the idea of profane illumination. Their surrealism was all rather organic and a bit utopian, one might say. Studies of prehistoric monuments in fields with cows in the background. Mental conflict, mad desire, loss of control. All missing big time. Jennings was not about to give ground to that, and why should he? We brought the everyday to people's awareness. Mass observation observed and studied the individual and collective absurdities of everyday life. We studied the coincidence and connections that people had never looked at before like shouts and gestures of motorists, bathroom behaviour, beards, armpits, eyebrows, anti-Semitism, distribution, diffusion and significance of the dirty joke and the private lives of midwives. Thank you very much, Andy. That was the second clip from Through the Bloody Mists of Time with Adam Kossoff and Esther Leslie in conversation around Adam's film. Now, Esther, thinking about uh, this idea of how we see this footage and this moment in history, which it comes back to us as it does whenever a, a film is played, I'm very aware that, of course, you know, inevitably in a film like this, we're, we're crucially aware of time. And that brings us to Benjamin's sense of the angel of history, but also the angel of the future, because the angel is being blown toward the time to come by the storms of, of history, if you like. And I wonder if you could think out loud for us a little bit about how this film, and particularly how Benjamin's thoughts uh, as expressed within it, can sort of help us think about what, what history means, you know, at, at crucial moments of tension. Because we're very aware that, you know, we can easily have 
sound bites about parallels between you know the 30s and now which might or might not be useful in a journalistic way but benjamin was op 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 obviously operating on a much deeper level and thinking about history you know in in a in a civilizational way far beyond the tropes of headlines and i wonder what your thoughts are around that relationship he had to time yeah so what what i find interesting in the film is the ways in which it um it flows flows stuff down you know al almost to the the point of um stopping in a sense you know and i suppose for me this this embodies or or this is a a version of benjamin's idea that you know history doesn't break down into stories into images or, uh, and it, if we want to sort of understand what has been we we arrest it and, and we seek details in in each moment of, of what has passed by in life mm -hmm. as as in a film strip that you can't stop and so ironically in this film you know it, it, it's held on to it's arrested we stare into it and with the benefit of hindsight we we see so much shocking stuff because we know what is to come out of um out of those those assemblies of, of matters of visitors who become consumers and parade nazis and all the the rest of it so you know but i think this also brings the title which is to do with historical time uh, interview as well you know benjamin talks about his arcade project of you know this this, en this engagement with this telescope that you know the telescope being his eye his mode of witnessing and putting that through the bloody mist of, of time of history through all the wars that separate his time of writing from that 19th century that he's looking at as the origin of the present and all the blood that is to come through the first world war and uh, and there's even more blood for us sort of looking back so we look back to that moment through the bloody myth of the second world war and everything that that involves so i think benjamin gives us this extraordinary sense of of history as something you need to to slow down to the point that you you can construct it i .e. understand it understand what its parts are and 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 looking back you you plug in the sort of knowledge of the, the horrors of the present to come and you see them embryonic in, in that um in that part so i think that's part of the work for things doing thank you very much indeed i mean just thinking about the damage if you like that esther's highlighted adam you know the sense that we have of looking back through you know through the bloody mist of time it's an extremely apposite title sadly to where we've been and where we appear to be now one of the crucial motifs if you like of your work which you in a, in a way exemplify because of the assemblage that you've made is this idea of the rag picker someone who kind of is literally scouring or gleaning through the the ruins through the wreckage for traces that can be salvaged and so that obviously is, a, is a, a direct link between the thematics of the work and your assemblage of it and i just wonder if you could again think a little bit more for us about what this idea of the fragment means to you as a filmmaker slightly different from the earlier question about about found footage but more about the and the, and the unfinished but more about what it means to actually take these moments however sourced and 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 tease out the narrative from them because that is clearly what you're what you're doing in your essay your wonderfully written essay you're finding a narrative out out of these fragments of ideas lives biographies places and so on yeah um just quickly to go back to the previous question in 1937 jennings started to to do to cull together pandino pandemonium the book mm. that you know the, the film is kind of roughly brought brings together the two the two books pandemonium and arcade project and they're both books that are based on the idea of montaging together different sections mm -hmm. of not exactly quotations but paraphrasing from different historical sources um so 
Jennings' this thing was the Industrial Revolution, and he was trying to map it out, not through his intervention, direct intervention, but through going through the British Library and finding different passages which kind of summarised the the kind of difficulties, if you were, and the positives and the negatives, if you like, of the Industrial Revolution. And so I think what was central to, to myself and to Esther was this notion of montage and looking at montage in a kind of modernist context and how modernist had kind of crossed over from the continent to, to Britain and how it'd been used, because, Jennings was very much in touch with what was going on in, in France and in surrealism in particular. So he was he was aware, perhaps more aware of a, than other British filmmakers at the time of, of this kind of this kind these the kind of aesthetics of montage, the kind of aesthetics of surrealism, and he put a kind of English or British gloss on that. But um, so both Benjamin and Jennings kind of regarded their books, Pandemonium and The Arcade Project, you know, both unfinished, of course, as um, starting points for looking at history, but looking at history in uh, an, an imaginative, non-linear way. So mm -hmm. they're both books that you can dip into, that you don't read them, you know, from page one to, to the last page, but you dip into them. <clears throat> and that was important to Jennings as it was important. Well, I don't know about Benjamin because we, we don't know how he would have completed that book. But for, mm -hmm. Je for Jennings, he had this vision of a book, which was basically a selection of different excerpts about, you, you know, uh, inspired by Milton's Pandemonium, of course. So, mm -hmm. um, so and also the other important thing to, to mention is that um, with Jennings and and uh, Benjamin often talk about the image and the, the relationship between the word and the image. And so for, for Jennings, the sections in the passages in his book are images. He talks about them as images. So he's very much, um, it's a very, I, I, I think it's a very continental thing, certainly for that time, to think mm -hmm. of, um, think in that way, to think along those lines that some a, a passage in a book can be an image rather than a, a, a collection of words, you know. So he was, he was kind of very focused on the, the imaginative interpretation of history, let's say. And it, montage was a, a way of of being imaginative about history. Tremendous. Well, that leads us into the third clip, I think, which which is looking at technology and progress. So let's have a look at that if we could now. Thank you very much, Andy. Like a latter-day flaneur, we should slow the world down so that we can see what lies underneath. Indeed, I once wrote, The mastery of nature, so the imperialists teach us, is the purpose of all technology, but who would trust someone with a cane used on children to improve their education? Jennings, coughing into a passing cloud, agrees, True. We can say that humans are slaves to the machines they create precisely because they have been educated with a cane, real or metaphorical. Benjamin replied, The cane is the technology of violent subjugation, but that is not where it ends. With the fetishization of progress, we're always on the edge of some abyss. Progress is like film, it moves forward intermittently a dialectical rupture between sensation and tradition. Read me a relevant passage from your book, any passage. Jennings picks a short passage from Pandemonium. The engine is the favourite, from an advert in the Times newspaper, 1808. We are credibly informed that there is a steam engine now preparing to run against any mare, horse or gelding. Meeting at Newmarket, the wages at present are stated to be 10,000 to 1. The engine is the favourite. The extraordinary effects of mechanical power is already known to the world. Thank you very much indeed. Now, thinking there about the extract from the book, just taking on that idea, Esther, um, Adam talked about the idea of writing a, a passage in, in the uh, 
uh, collection as, as an image. But of course, we are very aware that they are both meeting in the film and, and of course, renowned for their writing, the, the, you know, the putting down of words onto the page. And for Benjamin, of course, this was a, you know, it was a, an existential act. It was a hugely prolific act. It was alongside his life in, in every sense. And I just wonder what we think now about um, this idea of, 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 of Benjamin writing, writing his times and his history alongside his own frenetic life, because we are profoundly aware of how much he wrote, I think, once we start to engage with his work. I'm also reminded, given what you said earlier about the difficulties of, of his day-to-day -day being, of, of a, a fellow writer, Joseph Roth, for example, also living from hotel to hotel across Europe in a very difficult way. Uh, and for both writers, clearly, the word and the ability to put something down on the page that might or might not last uh, beyond its uh, appearance in print, or it indeed might not make it to its appearance in print, but it's the, it's the fact of writing and being that seems to be the crucial relationship here. Yeah, it reminds me of um, uh, something that Gretel Karpfluss, the uh, wife of Adorno, wrote to him in a letter um, that, that he was building a cave out of the quotations that he was finding in, in the uh, French National Library, that, which is quite a significant statement, I think, in the, the sense of the cave as, as, as a sort of a, a, a dwelling for someone who's you know, very precarious in his home, but a cave is also seems kind of quite protective, almost like he's burrowing into this library and and wrapping himself in words. And then what he's doing in that library is copying out you know, other, other people's words. So he's not just productive himself, he's ingesting all of this um, written material about Paris, you know, this spot that he says has had so much written about it more than any other place on earth. Um, so I, I think there's almost something talismanic about that, that thing of sort of writing it reminds me of another part of milton i think, I think it's milton isn't it that, that mark likes the quote about there's you know silk sort of gushing out of the silkworm but you know uh, an artist that is you know producing in order to to sort of make, make themselves as a kind of almost to write yourself into a, a, a space of autonomy and and free activity because for the most part he's not being recompensed for this work, but also like Baudelaire, his great anti-hero poet, you know, there's a certain amount of hack work going on, so he is trying to sell this or that review here or there, or justify a stipendium from the uh, Institute for Social Research by writing a review or a letter to Paris. So, you know, I think there's that there's lots of ways in which that, that writing um, serves him. But, and there's also all of that production of, of letters and extraordinary correspondence that's going on through this period when, you know, Europe is falling apart, but you know, the mail keeps up sometimes moving his notebooks around, sending them to people to hold on to and, and so on. So there's, there's something, you know, about really attempting to keep up lines of communication and connection that, that is it as you say, in a kind of political act to, to speak on in very unsolidaristic times. Thank you very much. While we're thinking about uh, the approaches in the film, Adam, think about writing the image, of course, I'd like to ask you about um, the, the, the sonic uh, space of the work, because, of course, you have also uh, created the, the, the sound design of, of the film. And at the centre of that, if you like, is this wonderful uh, piece of music by uh, Robert Lippock and Beatrice Martini, Branches, which serves as a refrain, if you like, and and it seems suitably titled as well, because ideas are constantly growing and developing in an arboreal sense, if you like, as the film develops. We we are super aware of this, this, this uh, kind of organic growth of ideas and experience. And so I just wonder if you could think for us a little bit about, about what that, that sonic space um, meant for you and how you were thinking about it working alongside the image and, and uh, Esther's narration? Yeah, that's a good question. 
There is a section in the film where actually I talk about the sound uh, via um, Benjamin and, and Jennings' discussion um, where they, uh, Jennings mentions that he was trained by the Brazilian filmmaker Cavalcanti, who mm. Cavalcanti came to work at the GPO. He was brought in. One of the more enlightened things that Grierson did, actually, he brought in Cavalcanti to get his filmmakers in his unit to think about sound more. And Cavalcanti told Jennings to use sound as counterpoint. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so um, that's like a dialectical thing again. It's like a montage thing. It's like... There's there's a there's a separation in 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 a lot of my work. There's a separation between the sound and the image, or you know the, the, the narration and the image, and there's an interplay with them. But it's kind of sometimes it's tangential, and sometimes it's difficult to connect. And sometimes you're watching the image, and sometimes you're you're listening to to the, the well, albeit quite sometimes quite a dense voiceover in this film. Um, so it gives you the freedom to find a space if you like you know you can get, we could go back to vertov's idea of the interval the montage creates an interval it creates a gap between two elements that kind of come together in a sort of in a synthesis if you like so so yeah so i mean that's the that's the general principle that i was working under um and the, 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 um, luckily i found this music and luckily you know, a lovely German composer gave me permission to use it. Um, obviously, the, the film was not made for very much money. Originally, it was a research project where we didn't get the funding to make it, so we made it with um, very little money. And um, so the music luckily arrived for um, free of charge. So that's, that's another piece of foraging, rag picking. <laughs> No, that, that, I'm glad. I'm glad it did come to, like that, and and you are exemplary at making uh, work that recovers these histories and stories, uh, you know, uh, for us from from the uh, bloody mist of time, if you like, you know, which are crucial to crucial to tell. And I'm really glad that you do, and I'm glad that people realise that and give you give it to you free of charge. So that's that's a good news story today. As we move towards the close of the formal conversation, I, let's have a look at the final clip we have tonight, which is. Moving towards towards the close of the film, if we could uh, look at the fourth clip, please, Andy. Thank you very much. People have made an industry out of my writings. That is no good. It's a bit pointless, in fact. It would be more use if all those books they wrote about me and my work were used as rocks in street battles, now that the cobblestones on the streets of Paris have been used up. Or to make Molotov cocktails to chuck in the turrets of the tanks of austerity that roll through the streets when the markets have crashed. No, Humphrey. I'm afraid we will never see the world in the same way. But what are friends for? To be twins or brothers and sisters in arms? Jennings didn't really buy into Benjamin's fruity melancholia. It's a bit late in the day for that, I guess, he replies. We associate as people and there's a certain kind of montage and coincidence that throws up new things and ideas. The kaleidoscope that still holds the ruling classes together must be smashed, so the sparks fly in the day and in the night. But what to do with all those pieces? Only in extinction is the collector comprehended, you once wrote. We can collect the pieces, but don't recycle them just yet. So very, very kind of poignant words there in all sorts of ways. Thank you for choosing that clip, Adam, because um, there's a, a lot in there that kind of speaks to our present moment. And, and Esther, um, uh, a, a kind of um, a, a, a wry wit in your reading of that, of course, around the idea of the, uh, the thinking on a larger scale around Benjamin as well. And I just wonder if we could think about where his work sits now. I mean, we're aware of the, of the kind of industry of, of, of his st of study and so on, but also whether we feel now that he is an active figure in the culture. You, I mean, the, the, the idea that his books will be used as rocks on the barricades is a great one. Um, but do you feel that as of right now, I mean, we need him more than ever. I, I think that's in no doubt. But do you think that he's active in the culture in the way that we would hope? Um, well, I probably 
doubt it at, at this moment in the sense that, you know, it's almost like that that image of Benjamin seems to evoke his initial kind of rediscovery in 68, you know, being read by the students in pirate editions and, you know, um, really being used as a kind of manifesto for um, uh, poster making and um, uh, photocopying and, you know, really believing in, in the capacities of low-grade DIY technologies for the period that existed up until punk and, and so on. Um, I think after after that, after, you know, Burgess sort of communication as well to it, the way of being um, I suppose there's been a, an ever increasing process of, of um, I suppose, academicization, I suppose, and that's the industry referred to. And of course, you know, I'm part of it, thousands of, of books on him. And there, there was meant to be, there was a, a film being made with, with Colin Firth playing Benjamin, which after. Jay Perini's book, Benjamin's Crossing, a sort of biopic, although I understand that's on hold now and the script has to be written and so on. But, you know, once you reach that level, you're like, there's a certain kind of main mainstreaming, and it's happening to all of them as a sort of, you know, biopics around Freud and the work. So that's not to say that, that, that it can't then be reanimated and reused and, and I suppose one of the things that I think about and thinking both about Jennings and about Benjamin is you know what what would we say about these platforms that we're using now about the ways in which digital technology the school the the debate around reproduction and piracy mm -hmm. and originality and you know all all those things that are probably even more pressing questions now in a sense and I think there's there's a relevance there but I also think that that um they're all of the kind of angry political um energies of of destruction and hate kind of ideas in, in Benjamin are um necessary I also do think they're abroad in the culture but they're not necessarily um uh, stemming from, from reading for Benjamin now because there are other kind of theorists and other ideas that are much more ascendant. Thank you very much. I mean, Adam, it's a slightly haunting thought, isn't it, to think of Colin Firth in a Benjamin biopic. I, I want to kind of sort of take that idea forward and think of Ray Winston perhaps in, in the, the movie soon to be released, A Summer with Adorno, perhaps, you know, and where do we stop, you know, with this idea of a terrible commodification of thinkers where the thought is absolutely right in the smallest print at the bottom of the poster. And uh, any any gossip in the life is kind of um, front loaded. But I think that's exactly what your own film, of course, doesn't do. It, it's, it's packed, it's texturally extraordinarily rich. It re requires, I think, and, and demands and, and respects rereading and rewatching. And I'm delighted to say, of course, that we can do that. It's available on DVD through the BFI shop online. Um, Esther's work, of course, is also widely available. And, and Esther, I'd like to say that while you obviously acknowledge your part in the industry, you are publishing about Benjamin with publishers who are engaged, and particularly, of course, with Verso books, who are an engaged and activist publisher in, in the best way. So I think there are degrees, of course, and I'm very glad that you're both at one part of the spectrum in terms of lived ideas and experience being central to how one thinks through scholarship. So it's been really fantastic to think with both of you about how important these thinkers, writers and artists are. Do please out there track down Adam and Esther's other work as I've just said. Many thanks indeed uh, to everyone at Whitechapel Gallery, both uh, the people behind the screen right now, Sam and Megan, uh, Andy as well, Jane and everyone else at the gallery for making these events possible. Uh, huge thanks to you for watching. You can watch this again, it's archived on the Whitechapel channels, on the website. Um, and of course, there are further events in the autumn programme. You'll find those in all the ways that you know how. Um, so do please uh, follow those. I will, I will be back on the 15th of October in conversation uh, around trauma, 
uh, CGI uh, reconstructions of buildings that were never built in the first place and much else besides. Um, definitely shared thematic overlaps with what we've been talking about here. But um, for now, it's been a huge pleasure, uh, Adam Esther, to be in conversation with you. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time. Thank you for being with us, uh, the audience. And uh, do sp please enjoy the rest of your evening. And we hope to be in touch and speak with you again soon. Thank you very much for being with us.